This will be audio only as we speak from an undisclosed location. But as you can see here, we've got our good old dead friends on the board, uh, John Calvin and James Arminius. And you may be wondering what they have to do with the Christmas message. Um, <laughs> they have nothing to do with Christmas. If you want a Christmas message, go everywhere else. <laughs> but here. Uh, but uh, what I this is a one we had ready a couple weeks ago, but um, for obvious reasons we haven't had a meeting. So, um, but what we're going to talk about this week is God's grace, and this is the sixth uh, lesson in the series called "Isms and Solas and Schisms." And as we're proceeding along, we proceeded along in, in Calvin's order of the tulip, and this week we'll be dealing with the eye and tulip. And as we saw in previous weeks, these guys agreed on a lot of things. They agreed that man was totally depraved, that man had lost his free will to choose. Um, they'd, they'd agreed that God had elected certain people to salvation. Um, and then they started arguing a little bit more on the L for limited atonement. Was the atonement for all or was it for just the elect? Um, this week, they will diverge. These two camps will diverge even more where Calvin taught irresistible grace, that's the eye and tulip, and Arminius taught resistible grace. You could resist God's grace. And it's it's a logical progression in this tulip as you as you climb this mountain. If you believe that man is totally depraved and man has lost his free will, then God must unconditionally elect certain people. If they can't if they can't choose on their own, God's gotta make it happen. And then of course with Calvin that atonement was only limited to the people that he unconditionally elected. And we just keep progressing in this logical order, uh, according to philosophy a lot of times in the traditions of men. They, they really didn't get a lot of this from their Bible. As we saw months ago, they brought that Greek philosophy in of determinism and, and indeterminism. So this week with the eye, they are going to, like I said, diverge even more. And... Um, this is a 400-year-old fight in Reformed theology and Reformed circles. Uh, anytime you hear people talk about, well, we go to the Reformed this or the Reformed that, it's going to be one of these two camps. Um, and we're not going to solve it. They're not going to stop fighting. They're just going to keep going. What, what we need to do is choose... You guys ever hear the analogy about the three men in the elevator? Three men in the elevator... Two of the men are fighting. The guy that gets beat up the worst is the third guy that has nothing to do with it. That's what I choose to be. I choose not to be the third man in the elevator and get involved in their fight. Because I don't have, if you're Michael Vick, I don't have a dog in the fight. <laughs> but uh, that's where we, we, um, we come to tonight. But the reason, why is this important? Well, one, we're talking about God's grace. That's a pretty important subject. How do we get God's grace? Can we lose God's grace? Do we need to keep it? Does God? Those are important questions to, to have answers to because every church in town follows to one degree him or him. And they're still arguing, well, where do I fall? Do I listen to the last person I heard? Do I listen to the best speaker I heard recently? Uh, so we need to sort that out for ourselves. Um, and every church in town, we were talking about this the other day. Let's put this is the Calvinist end of the scale, and the other is the Arminian end of the scale. Every church you go to has a dot somewhere on this. Either we're, we're Calvinist to the hilt, you know, we're over here, or we are full-on Arminian, or we're moderate. We can't make up our minds. We, we just stay in the middle. Points. What's that? We, have th- we only have three points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I, I've, I've heard people say that. You know, I'm only a three-point Calvinist. Or I've always been a two-point Calvinist, but I just want to be a Bible believer. I don't, I don't want to be an ist. These are men, neither of whom were inspired to write any of God's Word. Um, so I don't look to them for my theology. Can we learn things from them? Yeah. A lot of times we can learn what's wrong. So that helps us to, to understand more what's right. But every church in town is somewhere on this scale. And... 
it's funny, I've, I've seen churches that are actually two places on that scale. We are full on, we believe God sovereignly predestinates every perfect little thing in your life and He's working out His will in your life. And we also believe that if you don't keep doing the good works that God's going to take you out and throw you in hell. That's, that's preaching both ends of the spectrum. Either, you know, it's irresistible, unlimited or, limited or unlimited, or it's not. So, yeah, exactly. That is a very efficient way to hit both sides of the spectrum to, uh, to keep the money rolling in. But, uh, so you just got to watch out for that. And I don't, I don't want to be involved in that system. I don't want to be involved in that fight. I just want to be a simple man who comes to my Bible and figures out what's God's will for me? How do I get God's grace? Do I have to keep God's grace? You know, answer these simple questions. Um, and most people will ask the question, are you either or? Are you either Calvinist or are you Arminian? There's only two options. To most people there is. There's only two options. Either or. Calvinist or Arminian. Um, like I said, I choose not to be on the chart. I choose not to be the third guy in the elevator. I choose not to climb the doctrinal and philosophical mountain. I choose not to play. Anybody ever see that movie War Games with uh, Matthew Broderick back in the 80s? When they had that supercomputer that they put all the country's warheads in? Okay, never mind. That analogy won't work then. The computers, thank you, one. The computer finally figured out that the best way to win a game of global thermonuclear war is not to play. And that's what I come to in looking at these two systems. The way to find the right answers, the way to find the truth is not to play, not to get involved. Um, so when people ask me, am I a Calvinist or an Arminian? I don't say I'm either or. I say I'm neither nor. I will not play. I'm neither a Calvinist nor am I an Arminian. Now I say something like that and people in reformed circles blow a top. How, you know, because who am I really? I'm some 30 something year old punk and they, they revere the reformers and the doctrines and the writings and the catechisms and all that stuff so much, I come in and say, yeah, I'm not with either of those guys. I'm either a fool or I'm an arrogant egotist. That's how people in those circles will look at the statement that I made. And I'm, I'm neither. I'm neither a fool nor am I an egotist. Uh, just like I'm neither a Calvinist nor an Arminian. I'm just come to my Bible and let my Bible answer the questions. Um, but they say, you know, what do you do with this progression? Then? What do you do with the tulip or, as we saw the Arminians, they changed it to facts. How do you answer all these questions? Well, I don't. I just come to my Bible and let my Bible teach me. Um, let's start with that one. T, man is totally depraved. We study that, that he's lost his free will to choose right. That's what both of these guys believed. Um, it's, you know, I know we've gone through these verses. We'll just review real quick. Man, that's what they both teach. Man cannot choose right unless God intervenes and forces him to. Deuteronomy 30.19 And that comes from the philosophy of determinism. And we, we've gone over that. Um, Calvin was the determinist. Arminius was the indeterminist. But Deuteronomy 30.19 I, this is God talking. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. God's telling the Israelites to make a choice. Now, if they don't have the ability to make a choice unless God unconditionally elects them to make a choice, that verse is kind of a lie, or at least um, disingenuous, don't you agree? He's telling them to make a choice. Well, I can't choose. You're going to make me choose anyway, God. You know, it's, it's basically the same thing with Arminius. He taught that man had lost his free will too. He says, choose life that uh, both thou and thy seed that may live. 
You guys have all heard Joshua 24.15. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, and on and on. So God's telling people to make choices. And one choice leads them to death, and one choice leads them to life. So I'm really, I can't really hold the T in this little foundation of this philosophical thing because from my Bible it seems that God is pretty sure that man is not totally depraved. That man can make choices because God's telling him to. Um, saying that, I will say that the Bible does teach, and you see it cover to cover, that it's impossible for a fallen man to live sinless and to justify himself in the eyes of a holy and righteous God. That's quite clear all the way throughout the Bible. It's impossible for a man to save himself. He can't live sinlessly. He can't justify himself in the eyes of God. I would call that depraved, that I can't stop sinning and I can't justify myself in the eyes of a holy God. That's depraved, but it's not. doesn't mean I've lost my free will. <coughs> so... The other thing, too, is if you buy into this determinist philosophy that, that you've lost your ability to... You're essentially saying you've lost your ability to believe God's words. You know, If I can't listen to God and say, yeah, I believe that, I'm going to choose what He said, you're, you're essentially saying I, man is unable to believe God's words. That's the definition of faith. You're saying that it's impossible for man to have faith. Um, and you know from Romans 10.17 how faith comes... Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So faith is subject to you hearing the Word of God. You can't have it unless God gives you something to believe in. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but just as Paul said, told the Thessalonians um, in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, that Paul thanks God without ceasing because when the Thessalonians uh, received the Word of God, they received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth the Word of God which effectually works um, also when you believe. So if man is unable to believe God's words, then faith is impossible, and it's impossible for man to please God. That doesn't really work well with that system. That's why the, the reformers will come in and say, well, God grants you the miracle of faith. Um, yeah, that's quite a stretch. But So I don't, I don't buy into that system. So now I've kicked out the first peg in their foundation. I don't have to climb that ladder with them. Because they've misidentified the first term. So why, why do I have to, to fight the reformers and fight all the doctrines of that? I don't. Because they didn't even get the first one right. Um, having said that, I know, I know I've said this before. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, how can I study today and get everything wrong? How can, how can I come to God's Word and bring in some commentaries and come to the exact wrong conclusion? That's what I want to do today. Nobody does that. Everybody, you know, most people are well-meaning or trying to get it right, but most people have never been exposed to the fellowship of the mystery. That's why it's important for us to make them see, because that's the key to understanding how the Bible is put together. So, when I say I reject both, they give me the stink eye, um, look at me like I'm starting a cult or something. So, you know, starting a cult, I'm really bad at it. Don't make anybody give money. Don't compel attendance. It's terrible. Uh, <laughs> but point number two, the um, the unconditional election. Did God unconditionally elect certain people that he was going to force to be saved? Or did he elect a certain few for salvation because he knew they were going to believe and be saved? As, as these two go on and on about. Uh, and I'm not going to belabor this. We went through what election was. We studied our Bible and saw that um, election number one, God's plan for earth was about Israel. Israel was elect. I choose this nation. This is the people who I'm going to bring my earthly plan to fruition through. Um, the second definition of elect was the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose body we are, and we will fulfill his plan in heavenly places in Christ, the elect one. Um, so they, they misidentify what the elect is and then fight about whether it's unconditional or conditional. You can't, you can't come to a right conclusion if you uh, misidentify the terms. How can we get, how can we become 
beneficiaries of God's grace. So moving along, how can you, me, anybody that we know be recipients of God's grace? It's a pretty important question because we all know we need it. Um, But like most things in your Bible, where you get the denominations, where you get people fighting, is when people don't respect... First, they don't recognize that Paul received anything special. They don't see the revelation of the mystery. They don't see that God changed something and instituted this dispensation of grace. And they don't see that it's different from the Gospels or or the uh, Hebrew epistles. So they miss it. But what, what they do is they find verses that line up with what they already chose and they use those verses to the exclusion of others. Let me Let me demonstrate here. Let's talk on... This guy. Can I find verses in the heavy air quotes here, the New Testament? Can I find verses that demonstrate that a person can resist God's grace? Absolutely. Um, turn over to Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 4. Or punch in your iPad Bible to Hebrews 6, 4, or Facebook, or whatever you're doing over there. Hebrews 6, 4. Listen to this. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Does that sound like somebody that's unsaved or out of God's favor or out of God's will? If you're tasting the heavenly gift, if you're enlightened and made partakers of the Holy Ghost, that sounds like somebody who's on the right track. Um, And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew renew them again unto repentance. It's impossible if one of those people falls away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. That sure sounds like somebody resisting God's grace. I mean, if we're just reading verses and believing what we read, turn forward a few pages to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10:26. 10, 10 or 20. 10 and verse 26. Chapter 10, verse 26. Your outline says 20. My outline is wrong. Pay no attention to it. Uh, but look at the 1026. For if we sin willfully... Anybody do that this week? If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But what do we have to look forward to? A certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. So in 10, 26, and 27, in Hebrews 6, 4, it sure looks like we can resist after we, the people, the subject people of those verses can resist. And if they do, they get fire and destruction and judgment. That's Bible. We just read verses um, and believed what they said. Now, obviously we know the book of Hebrews is not written to us for our doctrine. It's written to tribulation Israel, but the people in the reform circles don't believe that. They don't understand that. They don't see that. They think that all these books are written to us. So what do you do with that if you're an irresistible grace guy like John Calvin? Well, those verses don't mean what they say. I, I heard one Reformed theologian talk about Hebrews 10, and he said it was just um, a hypothetical, just a hypothetical conversation because it could never happen. As somebody who's really believing hard their philosophy, they already believe. <laughs> because you can't read those verses and see that they don't say exactly what they say. Uh, but what about this side here, Mr. Calvin? Can I find verses in the New Testament that show that you cannot resist God's grace? Well, let's read. Ephesians 4.30. I know I've taken you to this one many times. 
Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until when? Until the day of redemption. Until the day of our body's redemption. Um, Colossians 2.13 Sealed to the day of redemption. You can't commit any sins after your body's dead, and that's what the day of redemption is, the day you get a new body. So I've got verses now that completely contradict Hebrews. What do you do with that? Colossians 2.13 says, uh, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has thee quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. All includes the trespasses I did last month, trespasses I'll do next month, trespasses I'll do next year, because God put that payment in place for sin long before I was ever born. and said, I've forgiven you all trespasses. That's all of them. Now, you know, obviously when we understand this, we don't want to add more trespasses to it, but He put in place forgiveness for all my sins before I ever committed one. That's sealed. That's forgiven. Well, what if you, what if you don't believe anymore? What are you, you have to keep believing. I mean, you can't just not believe. And, you know, you're sealed. That, yeah, that verse means what it says, but you know, if you don't believe, then you're going to unseal yourself. Come on. Second well, Timothy 2.13, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. If you believe the gospel, you're sealed, you're put into the body of Christ, you're in his body, he cannot deny himself. Are you going to mess up your eternal rewards? Are you going to... Are you going to have to think about it for all eternity? Yeah, but... So I've got verses now on both sides. I've got verses say, you can't undo it. It's it, you use Mr. Calvin's word, once you're in God's grace, it's irresistible. I've got verses from Arminius that say that you can resist, you can fall away. Um, you, can't, you can't make them say the same thing, if you're being intellectually honest. You have to go to church for a while to figure out how to make those verses match. Which people do. I've heard it done. That doesn't mean what it says, or you know, like I said, that's a hypothetical. Um, but if you're just being a reasonable, normal person, saying, I'm coming to this book, I believe these words, wherever they take me, you can't say they mean the same thing. It's silly. Um, but if you agree that this, these words on this page are God's truth and God's words, they cannot, they don't agree, that's obvious. But if this is God's truth, these, this set of verses and that set of verses, they cannot be speaking to the same people. Because they're completely contradictory. It would be like God saying, I want you to go right and also left. Which way do you want me to go, Lord? Go right and left. I can't. You know, it's like Yoki Berra said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Okay? <laughs> you know, it's... But, honestly, audience number one, if you fall away, you get judgment and wrath and hellfire. This audience, you're saved and sealed and forgiven all trespasses, even the trespass of unbelief. What do you do? This is where... Well, let's go back to the philosophers. Let's go back to the church fathers. Let's go back to the reformers. Let's go back to the doctrines and the catechisms. And because you can't answer it. That's why I am a dispensationalist. It's the only thing that gives an answer and lets it make sense and say, yes, this means exactly what it says. And by the way, yes, this means exactly what it says. That gave me my Bible back. I can believe this book again. Um, you know, most people are stuck with my church always says, or my pastor teaches, or my family always believes. That was never good enough for me. I'd been in the church. I saw the church people. I knew the pastor. I saw what the pastor did. He was not my shining light of holiness and glory, okay? Nice guy, great guy, loves the Lord, but I'm not going to look to a man for, for my guide. 
uh, my final authority, and he taught me to make my final authority the words of these book, this book here. Make this your final authority. That's why I can't sit in his church anymore. <laughs> That's why I am so weird. But um, letting God's word be true in every system and ism be a lie, I didn't know that was possible until mid-twenties, maybe late-twenties. I didn't know it was possible for that to happen. So, forgetting all these guys and forgetting the tulip and the facts and the seeing it's obvious that you can resist God's grace and fall away and for some people in the Bible, and it's obvious for some people in the Bible that you can't undo your salvation even if you tried. Back to the original question, how do we find grace? Um, how can a man receive God's grace? He would say, well, it's a supernatural force field that forces you. Uh, he would say a little bit different, but from our Bible, go back to the beginning, go back to Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of God, Genesis 6 8. How did he find grace? He was a just man, he was perfect in all his generations, and, and on and on and so forth. But Noah found God's grace. He'd never heard anything about a cross, never heard anything about salvation by grace through faith, but he found grace in the eyes of God. Uh, Hebrews talks about Noah, and it, Noah's funny because Noah is, in some ways, his object of faith is a little bit similar to ours, as Noah had to believe in something that he had never seen. Um, we never saw Christ in the flesh, we never saw the crucifixion, we never saw him rise from the dead and ascend into heaven, we never saw any of that, but we have to believe it, having not seen it. Well, Noah had to believe something he never saw either. Um, Hebrews 11.7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. So Noah's, Noah's object of faith was the bad news. <laughs> I'm going to flood the planet. <laughs> okay, that scares me. I want to live. So um, Noah's, Noah's gospel, his good news came as a result. Good news, build a boat and you get to live. Um, another one, Hebrews 11, is a, is a good chapter looking at the people in God's covenant program and their object of faith. One of my favorites is Rahab the whore. Um, by faith, you know, a harlot makes the hall. Of, the people like to call Hebrews 11 the hall of faith. A harlot makes the hall of hall of faith. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. What did Rahab believe? I believe Jesus will come in a thousand years and die for my sins. She believed that her nation was about to get wiped out. And she believed that God had given that whole land to the Israelites. And she'd heard the stories about what happened as they came out of Egypt and they were destroying people in their wake. She believed she was going to die if she didn't line up with God's people. It's not a cross. It's not grace through faith. It's not the death, burial, and resurrection. But she believed what God's object of faith at that time was. Um, had nothing to do with the cross. So we see in our Bible, you know, with just those examples, Noah and Rahab, people find grace in the eyes of God. People get God's grace by believing what God says to them. This is the object of faith. Noah, you will die with everyone else on the planet unless you build a boat. I believe you, God. I'll build a boat. That's how Noah finds grace. Same with uh, the Rahab. You're God dispenses an object of faith. And you can either choose to believe it or not. That's why it's so important to be dispensational. Israel was given the law program. They were given the law covenant. And in Deuteronomy 6, the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord of God, our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we believe in Jesus one day. No. Oh. It shall be our righteousness if we observe to do these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. So God dispenses this law program, says, do this, follow this. When you mess up, give these sacrifices. Follow this covenant, and I will make you righteous. You will find grace in my sight. So that's how you find grace. It's not some supernatural inward call or some divine, conditional, you know, it's nothing like that. It's you hear God's words to you and you believe them. If God tells you to build a boat, you build a boat. If God tells you, like He tells us, 
do no works. Don't trust in any works. Don't trust in the smallest little work you think might get you into heaven. Trust nothing but me, and I'll save you. That's God's dispensing his object of faith. And that's how we are saved. We believe the object of faith that God has dispensed to us. He dispensed that Christ was crucified and died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He dispensed that He was buried in the tomb and that He rose again the third day. We trust what Christ did for us. That is our object of faith. That's what He dispensed to us. We trust that and we receive God's grace. We hear about it through our Bible or people talking about our Bible or people just quoting the Bible to us. We believe it. We trust it. We're sealed. Ephesians 1.13. It's that simple. That's an important thing to remember when you, th- when you think about Peter and James and John and those guys. Um, they were not looking for the death, burial, and resurrection. We saw that in Matthew 16 where Christ tells them, hey, yeah, I'm going to go die and don't worry, I'm going to come back to life the third day. And Peter tries to stop it. So Peter was most definitely not looking forward to the cross. Um, and honestly if you're in one of these systems if God has unconditionally elected you which we know he would have had to uh, (laughs) had to be a random you know (laughs) if God's unconditionally elected you from before the foundation of the world you don't need a cross for that you don't need the cross to have happened You were unconditionally elected before the foundation of the world. You don't need a gospel. Um, That's a problem with my Bible because in 1 Corinthians 1.17, Paul's talking, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved... It is the power of God. If you're unconditionally elected before the foundation of the world, you don't need to be preached the cross. You don't need it to have happened. You don't need to hear about it. You don't need to believe it or trust it because God decided long before he was going to force you to be saved. What do you need a Savior for? So that's another reason why I get off this train because you start preaching a system instead of a Savior. Like I said, if you don't... If you have a system, you don't need a cross. We'll flip that coin over. Um, if God chose sovereignly, flip the coin over on you. If God chose, chose sovereignly to damn you before the world began, I, I'm sorry, you've missed the raffle. I will damn you before the world began. That puts God and the devil on the same team. Turn over to this verse. Second Corinthians 4. Second Corinthians four three, and a lot of Calvinist writings and teachings will say, "Yes, God sovereignly damned you to hell before the world began, and that glorifies Him, His sovereign choice to damn you." Um, that puts God and the devil on the same team. Second Corinthians four three, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. God and the devil doing the same thing. I've damned you. We see here Satan's trying to blind people's minds. How's that work in your theological system? You see why I choose to get off the train of all this philosophical stuff. So, finally, why don't? Why don't some people... We see how people get God's grace... You hear God's words to you, you believe them. Noah built the boat. Rahab warned the spies. The disciples on on uh, in Christ's earthly ministry, they believed that He was the Christ, the Son of God. We believe in our object of faith that Christ accomplished everything for our soul's salvation. So, why don't some people believe that? These two systems, you know, you have this one forcing people not to believe. You have that one kind of forcing people not to believe or not choosing them to believe. Um, why don't some people believe? Well, we saw that Satan's blinding people's minds with light. He's not blinding them with darkness. 
2 Corinthians 11, uh, 13 through 15, we see Satan's ministers are transforming themselves into ministers of righteousness. Come look at this righteousness we have over here at the First Baptist Episcopal Methodist Catholic Church. And we're just going to love Jesus and bring light and love and never give you the gospel and let you sit and come here for 20 years and give your money and give your time and do a bunch of religious stuff and we're never going to tell you the gospel. If that doesn't sound like the devil's work, I don't know what is. That's what Satan's business is. I'm blinding people with light and righteousness. And Come do good works with me. That's what the devil's saying today. He's transformed himself into an angel of light. Come do good things. We all love each other here. Come be a part of our love. Blind you to the gospel. So that's why a lot of people don't believe. Um, some other people believe because they just believe that Jesus and God and that whole cross and tomb thing, that's just one option. And we talked about this in weeks past. You know, it's the wagon wheel. There's many ways to God, and that's your path. And I'm so happy for you that you're happy with that path. But my path is over here with Buddha and Zoroastrianism. You know, they, people believe that. We saw that in Acts 17 when when Paul went and talked to the philosophers, the Stoics, the Epicureans, and they come tell us this new thing. That we want to hear this new thing. And, and Paul gives uh, his speech, and you know some made fun of him, said, "Forget that." Some, well, come talk to us again. We want to we want to hear more about it. And other people grabbed onto him, tell us more about the Savior. Uh, but a lot of people, you have you're blinded, or you just think it's one of many paths. Uh, some people don't believe because they don't think they need a savior. Um, you are self-righteous friends that just know they're better than you, but are much too polite to tell you. Um, they've never committed a sin. They've heard of sinners before, but they've never actually seen those. Those kind of people don't think they need a savior. They don't think they've sinned against God. They, and you ask them, "How are you saved?" And they start talking about all the good things they've done. I was baptized, I go to church every week, I tithe, I, I give to the poor, I work in the soup kitchen, I, I serve the homeless. You know, They start listing off all these good works they do. Um, and that always dings in my mind, Titus 3, 5, and 6, not by works of righteousness as we have done. <laughs> but you ask people how they... So they, they don't believe because they don't think they need a Savior. They think they're, they're fine on the own. Um, finally... Some people don't believe because they follow their heart. Uh, I was flipping through the radio the other day, trying to avoid Christmas music, and I heard a beautiful uh, voice come across the radio. This girl, female singer, singing this. Her voice is very pretty. You know, I, I don't catch lyrics right away. I kind of listen to the tune, and all of a sudden she breaks into the chorus, and the chorus is. The heart wants what it wants. And beautiful, beautifully sung song, The Heart's What It Wants. I came home and for some reason it was stuck in my head, so I Googled The Heart Wants What It Wants. Uh, it's a girl named Selena Gomez. And the song is about her wanting to restart her fornicating relationship with Justin Bieber. The heart wants what it wants. Exhibit A of don't follow your heart. I want to go back with Justin Bieber. That's a good idea. That'll work out great. Don't follow your heart. Um, I know we've gone long, so I'll wrap this up. Yeah. Homework is read Romans 1 and see what happens when you follow your heart. Um, it can get a lot worse than dating Justin Bieber. Uh, but, uh, you know, Romans 1, God's talking about a history lesson from the past, but people are the same. Uh, they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. They became vain, and their foolish heart was darkened. Percep professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And it just goes, it's, it's the circle, the cycle of declension. And at the end of this declension, you have a reprobate mind inventing evil things, um, who, knowing the judgment of God, and knowing that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So you can find yourself having a big party with a bunch of people having pleasure in doing things that you know God should judge and destroy you for. 
That's what happens when you follow your heart. Um, yeah, the heart wants what it wants. Run from that. The heart is desperately wicked. Um, so believe God's words. That's how you receive God's grace. You believe God's words to you and obey them. Um, now, these camps will say, well, you sa- you're saying you saved yourself because you said you have faith. So you're saving yourself through your faith. No, I just simply acknowledge the truth. I acknowledge God's word is truth. Titus 1 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. I heard God's words. I believe them. I acknowledge that they were true. And he saved my soul. So I did not save myself. I simply believed God's words and God's object of faith. He set me.